go ahead and introduce our four panelists. And um, the way we're going to do this is Ben and I are going to be just sort of roaming around during the Q&A. And if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll need to make sure that we get you on the mic so that we get you uh, your audio on the recording. So uh, when I describe you, call your name, go ahead and raise your hand just so that we can be sure uh, who we're talking about. So we're going to start with Nelson Manley. She is a WordPress designer who works for Ingenious here in Greenville. She's been working with WordPress since 2010, having begun as a self-taught freelancer. In her free time, Ellison loves live music and is heavily involved in the Albino Skunk Festival of the Roding Greer. Be sure to ask her about this. <laughs> Next up, we have Clifton Kennedy. He is our team lead here for WordCamp this year and last year. And he works as a developer at Drum Creative. He's a problem solver and likes working with the team to develop the best web designs possible. When he's not developing websites, he enjoys the outdoors and is, in a, and is a huge college football fan with Clemson, which is the best Go Tigers! in the nation. Uh, by the way, being his favorite team. Go Tigers. <laughs> Next up, we have David Zimmerman. David is an internet marketing consultant who specializes in search. He has several years of experience working with business to business companies, especially manufacturers. He started his own consultancy, Reliable Acorn LLC, after working in several agencies. David's core marketing belief is that all marketing should be measured. Yeah. Measured marketing is more effective and is less expensive. There's no excuse in David's mind for marketing efforts whose results are not measured. And lastly, we have Aisha Adams. And her bio got cut off, but Aisha was uh, a speaker in here earlier about social. So all things social media, she'll be able to handle for you. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. Raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, so I'll like, tell us about the albino stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is a three-day music festival in Greer, which is just outside of Greenville. It has started as a private party that this uh, guy threw, and then he got a band, and then he got two bands, and then over the years, uh, for like 20 years now, um, it has become a wonderful one-stage music festival with camping, RV sites available, or you can come back into town and sleep in your comfortable bed. Uh, and the music, um, it ranges, I guess Americana is probably the easiest broad term, uh, but it's had people you've heard of now, but you maybe didn't, hadn't heard of when they played. Uh, like one year, uh, NPR had like, Ten new bands we're excited about, and seven of them had played at Stunk Fest. So he's he's got a good ear for catching young and fun bands. So it's the greatest, and I help uh, coordinate all the volunteers and stuff. So I love it. It happens in April and in October. Two chances. Yes, check it out. Albinostunk.com. I'm working on a redesign. Okay. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> when, does, when do tickets go on sale? Our what? tickets are on sale now. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's April 10th or 12th or something. Okay. Hi, I have a question for David. Um, when you use GTM and all that data is stored, and then what if you give that website to somebody else? Is that data hard to transfer to new people? So GTM doesn't hold data. Oh, right. Google Analytics? Oh, okay, good. So um, the nice thing with Google products, GTM Analytics and all this stuff, is that you should never have to share a password with someone, but you should be able to grant them rights or access to something. So you can make from your GTM account someone the administrator of their GTM. I'm sorry, GTM, for those of you who know, is Google Tag Manager. And so it's a great, you can think of Tag Manager as a bucket to hold all of your analytics scripts and do some other coding things that you don't have to actually go into the page and edit it. So it's a product from Google that really makes a lot of things easier. And so the question really relates to the idea of how do you not own that and grant someone else access to that. And within there, you can grant someone rights to view it, edit it, and then make them the owner at which point they could remove you. So that, and that's the best practice because, you know, it is the client's bucket. Right, on the, they don't want to do it. Well, yeah. then they can pay you. 
to do it. Well, but I mean, I always just put it on my stuff. Yeah. And then someday I'm going to want them on my face. <laughs> right. They might want them. Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to create a Google Tag Manager instance under your account. Okay. It, I wouldn't make an account for them, give them the password and all that. That's not a good idea. But you can always delegate it and access to them. I have a ton of Tag Manager accounts that I've created that for clients I no longer work with. It doesn't hurt me or cost me anything to have it. Um, it is annoying to go through all of them to find the one I need. But that's what Control F is for. So I, I just find it. So um, I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the other way. You can delete it, and they say, well, wait a second, where did everything go? Well, you told me I could delete it. Sorry. Yeah. Did you, you might I got the mic. Oh, got it. Hold it, so it works. OK. Sir, um, you mentioned in your class about how Google does not release its like algorithm, logic, or philosophy. I'm just wondering. Why, in your opinion, don't they tell you more about what their like logic and philosophy is for how they look at sites and rank sites so like people know more so they can do more? Um, like, why would Google, that be a bad so, thing? Why would that be a bad thing? It so like the history of search engine optimization involves a lot of nefarious types to try to take advantage of it. And Google wants to make sure that the highest quality things go up and not the person who's best at gaming the system. So Google will frequently say things that they think are ranking signals. But they're, they're doing their own social engineering. And uh, SSL certificate is a great example of this. Right? They said, you have to have an HTTPS site. And if you do, you'll get a ranking benefit. Well, they didn't tell you how much ranking benefit or how long, but they wanted to socially engineer everybody to do it to HTTPS, which is a good thing, right? So they'll social engineer their suggestions all the time. Um, another thing was mobile, right? They're social engineering us to move to mobile. I think that's a good decision because everybody's moving to mobile. But they say, hey, we're going to give you a ranking boost if your website loads fast. Okay, they're social engineering us and listen to Google all the time to make us do what they want us to do. And that's not always bad. Um, like the, uh, the webmaster, uh, the manual review guidelines is another great example of this. They release these manual review guidelines and they make it sound like it secretly got out. No, they wanted us to see it, right? And so we'll take advantage of that and the benefit from these kind of little tips and tricks that they do us, but we, we just, Good SEO is not chasing whatever the latest social engineering thing from Google or, or this trick or that trick. Google is always going to be about the same basic things. Yeah, there's hundreds of ranking factors, but it's going to be, can Google read your site? Mm -hmm. Are you speaking the language that your customers are using to search for you? And what do other websites say about you in terms of links? Those are going to be the top three ranking factors all the time. Okay, site page part of it. There's probably a much lower part of it. SSL certificates, much lower. Okay, you have an alt tag that includes your keyword. Okay, sure, that, but that's probably not the most important thing. And so let's just focus. A good SEO focuses on the big picture and does the right things, plays the long play, rather than you know finding the secret trick of week. But is that? Yes, yeah, it does. Thank you. I had one more question, but I'll, I'll relinquish the mic for someone else, and I'll ask it later. Go <laughs> ahead. All right. Um, in this is specific to your class again. Um, you mentioned that a good site, according to Google, a good site is a site that accomplishes its goal. And I'm just wondering, like, that was a little over my head, because how does Google actually know if my site's accomplishing its specific goals? So. When, it, uh, when I was referring to when Google considers the, the website a high quality website, it's the website that most accomplishes its own goal. Mm -hmm. That is in Google's manual review guidelines. Okay. So that's what it's telling the people it hires to manually review the search end results 
how to manually review a quality of site. Okay. We use the Google manual review guidelines that they provided, or leaked, or however you want it, you know, whatever makes you happier, to, to say that's probably what Google would like the algorithm to resemble. And the algorithm is pretty smart at this point. I don't know enough about AI and machine learning to know how the Google algorithm might identify a website's goal or qualify whether the website does a good job establishing that goal. But the fact that even if it's not an SEO ranking factor to have a website productively accomplish its goal, like, you should probably have a website that tries to accomplish its goal, sure. right? If you're doing social media, you're the expert. Would you like a website to effectively accomplish its goal? Of course. <laughs> I would. <laughs> but it made me think about, you know, as a blogger, when we write blog posts and we're trying to SEO those blog posts, if I say this is this is this blog post is what are the ingredients of pizza, and then you get to the end of it, and I'm talking about, you know, something else, like how to set a table, then how can it rank? Because it doesn't have enough, the search terms in there enough, it doesn't have that keyword density, it doesn't have uh, just the, it just, it's not gonna flow all the way throughout, and so I think the algorithm can pick that up and rank it lower. So, of course. Thank you. Another search engine optimization <laughs> question, I'm sorry. Um, how important is the name of or the actual URL? So example, if you're in interior design, or if the word interior design is in your URL or something like design, how much does that matter? Do you mean the URL or the domain name? Or both? Both. Okay. So. A few years ago, Google got really tired of people buying domain names that automatically ranked for a particular keyword. And so they released an algorithm correction that was purely dedicated to people buying domain names and trying to rank for a keyword. And that worked so well that two years later, they released another algorithm update to say, we are really, really sick of you guys buying a domain name and ranking for that. So there are two algorithm changes in the last few years that are just specifically targeting what they would consider web spam in doing that. Now, that being said, um, it still works to a degree. But I think what we can't forget is while we're doing SEO, there's other business factors we have to consider. You know. When I decided that my company name would be Reliable Acorn, I didn't have the word SEO in there because I didn't want to pigeonhole myself to be the SEO guy. And I wanted to be as flexible as possible. Had I put the word SEO, SEO, SEO Reliable like Acorn, I don't know what I would have done, right? <laughs> but okay, I mean, yeah, maybe I would have ranked better, maybe. But like, there's more in this world, even though I'm an SEO guy, I love doing SEO, there's more in this world than SEO. So do I really want to pigeonhole myself? Um, I've also seen clients get advice, like you need to have a domain name that resembles your keywords, and they change their website to a keyword-friendly domain name, Tank, because there's no history to that domain name. Right. So yeah, Technically, it might help you, but don't be so focused on SEO or think that one ranking factor is going to fix all of your other problems of website marketing. I was thinking more of a startup that's tr trying to come up with a name, not well, switching someone's yeah, name. That's I mean, got different implications. Right, and yeah, I give the same advice. I mean, I was a startup four years ago when I decided to start Reliable Acorn, and right. you know, I. I, I'm not saying I did it the right way or, you know, I ranked number one for whatever term I can think of at this point, but, you know, just don't focus on one ranking factor and pigeonhole your business into commitment to that one thing so that in a few years when you realize that 
SEO is all about voice search now, and oh crap, like no one searches for SEO, and now my domain name involves SEO, and now I can't get business because people think I'm old school and technology. You know, there's all kinds of things to worry about like that. That's why I kind of did something neutral, and I can work with my business to be make reliable of whatever I wanted to be. If I wanted to pivot it into something else, I can. And, and that's why I did that. Now, again, we're talking about a URL after the domain name. Yeah, maybe. But again, one ranking factor. But I guarantee you, as you, the people who tend to change their URL to a different keyword will actually suffer even if they 301 redirect it. It would be better to have a less optimal keyword in your URL, not even including your domain name, and keep it that way for a long time than to change it for maybe a marginal, tiny little advantage and then, because you're going to lose a little bit from the refract value. So, uh, yeah, I, that's, I hope that's some good advice to just not focus on one ranking factor and make that your entire SEOs or even a significant part of your SEO strategy. So I've got a uh, SEO question. <laughs> well, we got other experts here. Does everyone care about SEO? No. I don't care about SEO. We know more about the analytics, actually. So I have a little bit of a concern. It seems like with Google Analytics, you're able to add about 50 analytics accounts, and then it kind of shuts you off. So what I've done is, under some of the accounts, I've noticed you can make 50 sub-accounts. How do, how do other people handle that? <laughs> I can answer that question. <laughs> so I got well, I got a mic over here. Okay. So, um, so as a developer, I didn't turn the mic. Okay, as a as a developer, we set up the the um, Google Analytics accounts, and um, and we actually have three accounts right now that have almost fifty plus sub accounts in them. So we have. Um, one account that has 50, it maxed out, so we created another one, and, so, and it's maxed out, and now we created another one that has almost maxed out, and when that one's maxed out, we'll just create another one. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Yes, but it's difficult, then you got to have three Gmail email accounts, right? Um, no. No, because it, it's kind of... It's almost like folders. Yeah, it's, yeah. I was going to say, it's almost, we have the same thing, we log in with our <coughs> one admin account and then we can have up to 50, I, I, I think of them like folders, like yeah. in Genius 1 and Genius 2 and Genius 3, and then inside in Genius 1 are the 50 sites that we oh. are um, built, you know, making analytics for. That's exactly how we have ours, ours says drum creative 1, drum creative 2, drum creative 3. And, and when we hit that max and drum creative and three, we'll have a drum creative and you four. Can search, and you can search, yeah. you know, when you need to access one, you can search, and it searches through all that, so it's not like you have to know which folder to go to to yeah. then search. All right, that just answers the question. So well, I was going to say, yeah. I've got the 10 left. I can make, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, we get you make, yeah. 10 people have some folders. Yeah. But be careful, because if you make it a <laughs> subfolder, and then you want to pass analytics access to somebody, you can't without killing their account? No. Nope. You can move it. Well, so, so there's an ambiguity <laughs> in the question, right? There's a Google Analytics account, and then there's accounts under Google Analytics, mm -hmm. and then there's profiles and views. Yeah. If you make profiles. a profile for each one, you can't move it from a profile to another account without always maintaining access to that. But if you, you should you could create accounts within your account, again, right. ambiguity in the way Google Analytics does it, in which case you might have to use multiple emails because you'll max out after you have 50 accounts within your account. Right? Because you always want this, think about your analytics as your client's property <laughs> that they own and have a right to. They can't, they take, they can't make us not yeah. owner anymore. At a certain point, if you, if you, if they are a property of your of an account of your account, you they you can't delegate that to them. 
and that would be could be a problem. That's why he's answering all the SRO questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's really confusing the way Google Analytics calls things, but be careful about setting up analytics in a way where you can't get out of it because that either means you have to show me all of your clients. It's none of my business. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see all your clients, but it's none of my business. Right. Or they can't get themselves out of it. And then, then they have to start over and traffic starts at zero. I mean, traffic doesn't start at zero, traffic contains, but like, then you'll have any history. We've got a question over here. Um, this is not an SEO question. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm a blogger, and I wanted to find out with, with such great diversity that we're learning about with work in conferences. In our content creation, how do, we, how do we diversify our content to attract and meet the needs of the diverse audiences we connect to using different social media platforms? So I think I understand the question. What I would say is your analytics, right? If you're looking at your analytics and you see that when you come to WordCamp and you pull speakers to the side and you're doing interviews and they do really well and people are engaging and asking questions and sharing, you want to do more interviews. If you see that, um, if you see that pictures are doing really, really well on Instagram and you're tagging other people who are here and we're resharing those things and you want to continue to reshare those things. Um, what I like to do with my analytics is check to see where my shares are because that's where my biggest reach is. Um, and if I, I don't, if I have something that has a reach and that the engagement is less than 10%, I don't do it again. Um, I try to stay at that 10% mark. Now when you look online, everybody says like 10% is good. But 10% is not good to me because I want to be, you know, above everybody else. And so I have set my marker where everybody else is like, it's good. And so I'm looking for a 25, 35% engagement on what I'm doing. So do what you do. Have a lot of fun with what you're doing and figure out what works for you in that way. And then take what you're doing and match it to what uh, your people are doing and what they like. And, and you will be able to figure out what content is best whether it's video or audio or pictures or blogs or or whatever it is. Um, so I think one thing that I've always struggled with in this entire industry is like, I mean, call them campaigns, but just social media in general. I mean, both for, you know, advertising my personal like freelance business um, for sites that we own like or that are, are owned by my company like at work um, and so we work on one that has uh, you know gets a lot of SEO traffic we it's a review site and we've been trying to build up our social media campaign and really kind of struggling with it and so I'm kind of just wondering if there's any like tips that are gonna help um, I mean you know engagement as a whole so and then also one of the things that we do is every time we see one pop up you know from this business is we all like it but what's all kind of resulting from that is it's all the same people that are all liking these posts yeah. you know is there anything wrong with that is there anything better that we you know that we can be doing or to make it yeah, of course. So one of the things that I see a lot of people do is they use their social media to advertise. And of course you should use your social media to advertise, but you should first use it to be social. So think about your social media as another person. If every single time I approach you, I want to sell you something, would you like me very much? Mm -hmm. um, if every time I approached you, you were throwing information at me and not collecting information from me, would you like me very much? And so I think one of the things that you have to do is create within your brand a personality. And your social media allows you to have a personality as a brand. And so if you have a site that's a review site um, and people are reviewing, um, what else are you doing there? Are you sharing coupons? Am I getting something? What value are you adding back to me? Why would I want to come every day? And so one of the things I see small businesses miss the mark on is that your social media should be for education for celebration, 
for restoration, for information. And so there's all these different ways that you can use poet. <laughs> so all that information you can actually like use and have other goals. So sometimes it's not about the sales goal right now. Sometimes it's about just that, like, can we get to know each other goal? And sometimes it's about, well, let me show you how to do this goal. Um, one of the things that I think business can do to drive engagement is to speak to the customers they already have. If your your customers who are buying your product don't see value in your social media, no one else will. So if you have a product, let's just say you have a laundry detergent and you have a hat to make it last longer, the people who already buy that, they want to know how to save money and make it last longer. So they're going to share it, and then people are going to see it, and that's how you're going to get that engagement. So use your social media wisely, not just for advertising. It could be for customer service. It could be for market research. It could be for growing your list. It can be for advertising. It could be for educating. It could be for establishing yourself in the industry with the other people in your industry. So there's so many different ways that you can use the social media and make sure you're diversifying that, how you're actually using it. And I think that will drive your engagement up pretty quickly. Thank you. So along those, those lines of the things that you're talking about, I wanted to ask you, because there are a lot of people who want to do all of that, how do you overcome what a lot of what I have with a lot of my clients is the shyness. You know, they want to engage, they want to get themselves out there, they want to get their message out there, but they are so used to the old way where you just have a website. Look, you can see everything on my website, but I'm like, now it's time to start engaging. How do you help people overcome that? So I don't know how to help people overcome shyness because as you can see, I'm not shy. <laughs> but what I will say is that we as an industry have come up with ways where you don't have to use your face to engage. So unboxing videos. Raise your hand if you've ever seen something unboxed. So if you have a product or service and you don't have an unboxing video up, that's on you. Your face is not needed. Right? That's one of the most types of watch videos on YouTube ever. Right? Brand ambassadors. Raise your hand in here if you are a blogger or an influencer and you would love to be an ambassador for other people's products. Engage people who are not shy. Allow them to rest on their audience. They know what they're doing. Allow them to uh, do that for you. Uh, <clears throat> infographics. I love a good infographic. Something that people can print off and pin up and use. Perfect. It does not have to be your face. I know I go around from conference to conference and everybody's like, video, video, video. Well, at some point, there's some jobs. People can't watch video. Sometimes in the day, people can't engage in video. So you should have video, but what about audio? Maybe I need to listen to it when I'm riding in the car. So even with the SEO, one of the things I was sitting here thinking is, it's really not about all of these little bitty things. It's, again, just about finding your people. Who are the people who are interested in what you have to sell? Who are they? And can you engage them by educating them, entertaining them, and elevating them by solving their problem? Very simple. Then SEO is not that big of a deal because you know what the title of your blog post needs to be because you're educating people. And you know what they're looking up on Google because you've heard them ask you the question a million times. And so when you put up, like, how do I like hang a curtain? Hang a curtain is the, the SEO term, and it's right there. And so a lot of this, people are finding intuitively because they're finding their people, they know their niche, they know what they're talking about, and just be an expert at what you're an expert at, and the SEO will fall into place, and the social media will fall into place. Get interested in your customer. Stop making it about you. Get interested in what their problems are. Start trying to solve problems, and I promise you, a lot of this stuff will just, will just start to happen. <laughs>
Uh, I know if I send emails to my uh, godsons, I won't hear anything from them because they don't read email anymore. <laughs> um, this raises questions about target audience and the use of social media because if you're not reaching uh, people who are potential customers, you're losing out on that business. So what do you see as the, uh, I guess, the, the trends in social media and uh, how do you select which social media to engage with based upon who you, where you see your customers? So each algorithm is different. Just like Google has an algorithm, so does Twitter, so does Facebook, and Instagram, and Snapchat. So it's up to the individual influencer to pick, number one, what platform are you, do you work well with? So for example, my primary platform is Facebook. I reach 2 million people a month with no ads on Facebook monthly. So that's fine. That's where my, that's where my people are. That's where my audience is. So if you know where your audience is, you can get in that sweet spot. If the younger people are your audience, then you should be where they are, which is going to be the Instagrams and the other, the newer places, um, like Snapchat and those other places, right? So first of all is identifying, what am I good at? Don't try to do something that you're not good at because you're going to fail, right? So don't do that. So figure out, am I good at this? Can I do this? Number one. So start with yourself. And then can my customer access this? And so looking at, we know that on Twitter, there's mostly journalists, people who make $150,000 a year. So I know when I get on there, I need to use my big words. I need to make sure everything, my hashtags are a certain way. Versus when I'm on Facebook, I can be a little bit more relaxed. Those are the grandmamas and the aunties of the world. They're, they're on Facebook, right? And when I'm on Snapchat, I need to be cool and fresh and hip. And I need to use more bright colors because that's where the young people are. So it's about identifying what you can do really well and where people are. And I have to, will tell you this. We hear blogging is dead, SEO is dead, Google is dead, da, da, da. Like, find your people. And if you find your people, they will stay attached with you. If you have people who understand the work that you do and they value what you bring to the table, they will follow you from Facebook to email to Snapchat to you know, wherever you go. And so, it, again, it's really about cultivating an audience and being valuable to them at all times. That's really what it's about. If you can bring real value, they will follow you anywhere. Look at Oprah. Like, right? So, first she was on TV. Now I know I'm going to log into YouTube to find her on Soulful Sundays. And if she decides to go to the radio, I'm going to follow her to the radio. And if she says, okay, we're going to all be meditating until I come down from the sky. There's like millions of people sitting around <laughs> meditating and waiting on Oprah to come from the sky. Because Oprah has an audience. You have to, and that's what it's really about. Like really cultivating a relationship of value. I need David because he has all the SEO tips. Right? Like I need all the developer tips for Clifford. And so if he's constantly delivering and you're constantly developing, it doesn't matter where he goes. If he says, you need to be in my living room at 4 o'clock, you're like, I'm here. <laughs> so that's really what I want you guys to do is really find out how can I speak to the hearts and the minds of the people who buy from me and create lifelong relationships. Because once you create the lifelong relationships, I promise you they will follow you wherever you go. Uh, I'll ask a question. Um, I'm going to blow it up a little bit. Throw it, throw it toward the designers and to you, Clifton. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you guys prefer on the design side when it comes to, let's say, page builders, super themes, I guess you could call them, whatever people call different things, or regular premium themes versus regular themes versus, let's throw it out there, good bird. <laughs> what? Uh, which one do you like? Which one do you prefer? Do you have certain themes over, you know, that you like to work with? Have you played around with good bird? Do you like it? So I know there's a lot of things in that. Good question. Let's we probably have different takes on it. <laughs> I, as, a, as you mentioned in my little intro, I came, I'm kind of a self-taught uh, designer. I, have, I had no background in it uh, other than being really good at PowerPoint. 
Um, <laughs> and so for me, the first time I saw a premium theme with a visual composer, it was like life changing. You know, I was like, I can do this. Um, and now that I'm working in an agency and, and just cranking out so many websites over the last seven years, I have learned some HTML and a lot, a lot more CSS and that kind of thing. But for me, having a premium theme with uh, some tools <coughs> built in that so I don't have to think uh, or know how to create it, um, it has it has made my job, you know, doable. Honestly, um, I think of it like. Uh, you know, a puzzle, putting the puzzle together. I've got all the pieces here, um, and I get to put it together in the, in the most attractive way, in the best way to lead the user where I want the user to go. Um, so I love premium themes, and I love visual composers, and I, I know that they're a little clunky sometimes and slow, and, and um, that there's an attitude of like, <coughs> it took me a long time to be able to say I'm a web designer, because I thought, well, I'm not really. I just use these tools that someone else made, and I just put them together. But that is, that took, you know, I have finally accepted, like, I'm, I'm designing the websites, I'm just using these other tools to do it. And I think it's awesome. Um, we use premium themes at Ingenious, and I think that if you look, we have about 170 sites live right now or something, and I think if you look through our portfolio, you know, there's very few that look anywhere close to the same. You might be able to pick out a few things to know they were built on the same thing, but it's not cookie cutter at all. Um, and then there's plenty of space to expand. When you've got the building blocks there, you that's when you're really free to say, okay, I can start with this element that the theme came with, but what if it did this little thing different <coughs> instead? And so then that's where the knowledge that I've picked up on CSS and some of those other things I can I can add to it and then make it more unique. Um, and more in line with the client and their brand. Um, so my favorite theme, premium theme, is called Salient. Uh, it's available on ThemeForest.net, and it is, uh, uh, it's beautiful. And uh, there's a new one that we've been using a lot that's made by Themarella. So if you went to Themarella.com, it's called Boo Thing. I like to call it my Boo, my boo Thing. Uh, <laughs> And it's a really good one too. It has tons of options, and and again, all these premium themes come with dozens, if not hundreds, of demos to help kind of give you inspiration and see like, oh, I, I knew they had this element, but I never thought about using it in this way. So that will work really well for such and such on this client's website. So that's how I that's how I roll. It's not it's not how everybody rolls, um, but I I would I for that very reason I haven't even looked at. Google. I, I immediately turn it off, and uh, my coworker built something with it, and he said, it's pretty cool, like, yeah. I'm like, great, you have fun, I'm doing this, you know, and if I have to, I'm a little nervous that at some point I'm going to have to, like, that things are going to change so much, I'm getting old, it's hard to change, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm also adaptable, and so I will figure it out if I have to, but I haven't yet. Before you answer that, Clifton, and you've died into that a little bit. Who, who has you to work? Okay, Cliff, you got it. You got it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, go ahead. How many people install Classic Editor immediately upon it? <laughs> <laughs> How many have had a client call you and apologize for not being able to use it? Divi 
that drum a little bit, and um, and it's it's amazing what you can do with a with a uh, theme and a um, a page builder. But I'm gonna say I struggle with Divi, and my but my um, page builder of choice is Elementor, and I've only been working with it for six months, but it's amazing how far that page builder has come in six months. And and they, they got over two million installs, and they did it in a year and a half. And, or, yeah, so the first year they had a million, and then the next seven months they had two million. And, um, but I, did, I like it, and I, I, five years ago I would have never, I, I would, didn't think I'd ever use a premium theme or a um, or a page builder as a developer, and uh, because I know code and I know how to write it, I, I can do things that I'm gonna do, you know, just by writing it from scratch. Um, but if I can get a site done faster and you know, and it look awesome and run very fast, you know, and then I'm gonna do it, and um, as long as my boss says I can. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, I guess my premium theme of choice is Astra, because it works beautifully with Elementor. You spell it? Astra? A-S-T-R-A? Yeah, Astra. And WPAstra.com. And um, it works beautifully with Elementor. And, um, but, you know, if, I like Divi too. I mean, it's great. It's just a struggle for me right now coming from a um, custom, you know, pre custom themes built. So. You didn't mention Divi Bird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's cool. <laughs> it's good for I, I would love to learn how to build, you know, custom blocks. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm a, I'm a big ACF guy, so, no, I'm a big ACF guy, and, um, you know, it's ACS the best, and, um, yeah, I mean, I use it with, with page builders, which is great. You can use it with page builders now, which is all ACF with page builders, so that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I also use Elementor, and I just wanted to add another thing that worked really well with it, Flocks. HLOX. Um, it had a portfolio taxonomy which I really needed, so I'm going to ask for that. Yeah, Astra has, has one too. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say that again. So you spell it out again. Just make sure. P H L O X. P H L O X. Everybody hear that? Okay, so this is less of a question, more of a comment also. Um, well, don't feel guilty. <laughs> if there's any guilt there, don't feel guilty. And the reason why I say that is because um, we have hammers, we have movers, we have retractors, we have all those things. Yep. And you use the tool that's more efficient. You know, you go from a screwdriver to a drill to your super, super powerful drill. You have your, um, my favorite little tool I just forgot what it's called because that's what happens to me when I'm speaking in public. But you have those things and no one says, you use that camera, you need to go back and create a mold and pour the the you know the metal into there and cast that iron, I mean that camera, you know. No one's expecting that. So if you've moved on to a place where you're using your old skills and some new tools simultaneously, then that's everything because you're doing um, things faster, more efficient, and you can also put that extra little extra touch on it because you know the code. So when this plugin doesn't work exactly the way you want it to, or when this, you know, whatever part of the website you're doing what you want, you want to put your spin on it, you know exactly how to do it. So I'm like, go. Yeah, I will say that. I will say that um, it's like it's it's awesome. Like you know, the page builder, the page builder aspect of it. Um, when I started using it as a developer. It blew my mind. Like I was like, why? Why didn't I start using this earlier? Like, why did I have? Why was I? Why was I so close-minded? Yeah. So. 
Yeah. I, I'm right with you when it comes to the elementor. I, I come from the same background as you. I do things hard coded. I wrote my own, had my own base team that I was using for a long time. And I, the trade off of, you know, not so pretty code is perfect because it saves me a ton of time. Where I draw a distinction, though, is the premium themes. Not all of them, but the ones you're talking about, specifically Divi and Aveda and those type of super themes. You said what? Aveda. That's a lot of them. I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm throwing that. I said, I said that. That's a harsh word, but I stand by it. <laughs> <laughs> my, my problem is, though, with big themes, the most premium themes, themes is that they have functionality built into them. You mentioned the taxonomy. What happens in three years or five years when the client needs an upgrade to, the, to a new theme? You've lost all that. You can't upgrade them. You can't change themes. So I just, I prefer to keep all the functionality either in plugins or function files and keep a, a theme that only does theme, does nothing else. So, I've, I've built a theme with it. Um, with Avada? No, no. <laughs> with CSS Grid. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are fighting words. So I'm gonna, I'll jump off the stage. Uh, no, I've actually built, um, I use it very sparingly. I'll say that. So, I have my framework. When This was before, when, before I started using Elementor. At, um, and so I, I built one with like certain elements. I started using, building certain elements. Like um, I would have three or four different elements straight built across, but I always had to, always had to build a backup for that because of, I hate IE. But um, because of IE, I had to do flexbox back or uh, fallbacks. So, um, but I was I was looking at the WP Astra theme, and they're using CSS grid, which kind of blew my mind a little bit. And I was like, how do they handle that in IE? And um, and I'm still looking into that, but it kind of blows my mind that they're they're using it. I mean, it's a, a powerful tool, and it's, um, and you don't have to rely on things like. Um, as much as I like, you know, um, bootstrap and all that, you don't, you're not stuck with a grid and uh, foundation, you know. I, we used foundation and I a lot at Drum for a while when we built custom themes. And, um, but I felt like, and Joel would probably tell you the same thing, when you're building out a grid and you need five, you need five across, and uh, foundation only gives you four, you know, then you have to like manually build your grid out, but if, if we had CSS grid at the time, I mean, it, it's like five lines of code, and you're, you got your grid. So, I mean, it, it's a pretty awesome tool, I, I really like it, and um, I'm excited to see it grow. Okay, this is a question going back to the page, page builders. Um, and I, my background has just been doing custom ACF stuff, whatever. Um, a big part of our content strategy uh, process involves thinking about what happens when we give the site over to their client. Can they maintain it? Are they going to make it all ugly? Like, will the design character? So um, I know with ACF, it's, it's been really nice because we can lock it down so that only do exactly what we want. They can't change the color, they can't change, you know, a, it's very, you know, we can limit it and give them just the amount of flexibility. Can you do that with, I don't know, I've, I've played a little bit with Divi and some of these others. I've not had any search with Elementor, but I'm curious, can you lock it down so that when you hand it off to the client, they can't just do whatever they want? And I think they can do that with Gutenberg. 
<laughs> yeah, you just turn the pot a little bit. Yeah. So, so you can do that. <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. But so I have a YouTube channel, I'm, and so my last few videos uh, have been about Elementor and ACF because I, I love ACF. That's like I said before I started using page builders. I used ACF and custom. And but in I think it was like Elementor 2.4, they integrated um, dynamic content where you can um, you can integrate ACF fields. So what I'm trying to figure out for my next video is to how to how to figure out how to make the the regular content area disappear and just so the ACF builds. And um, so they can't mess with the page builder, you know, and and mess that up and mess the design up and because I don't want them coming back. I mean I'll help them all they want to, but if if I can, you know, make it more distraction free, then that's what I'm gonna do for the client. So um, but um, when I found out that you could use ACF with Elementor, it just made my love for Elementor go up. So you can do that with Divi too. So it, it's not just Elementor. I'm not just an Elementor guy. So um, you can do that with Divi as well. I think you can use ACF with the bottom too. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let it go, man. Let it go. <laughs> If I, if I could speak on that as well, um, because I, I use a ton of different page builders. This one? Yeah, yeah. a little bit. <laughs> um, so I use a ton of different page builders, and I've also done custom. Um, I've done it both ways. And I do agree with you, uh, ACF, you can lock things down, so the client can't do a thing. You know, like, it's, 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 it's exactly how you built it. Um, the, the thing is, like, the flexibility there, any time that the client requests a change, you have to go in and make that functionality in ACF. You're the one that has to do that. So I think the cool thing about using a page builder with ACF, like Elementor with ACF or with uh, any, any any page builder. Can Why didn't you say did? Word, WordPress, can, WordPress is <laughs> as extendable as you can make it. So you can use your page builder of choice and give the client the flexibility they need so they can change, you know, a color, a color of a button if they need that to be a different color. Um, but you can also use other plugins such as Admin Menu Editor. You can, you can use that to take away things that the client doesn't necessarily need to worry about. And uh, you, can, you can modify and extend the page builders as well, so there's certain themes, there's certain elements that they don't necessarily need. There's certain fields that they don't necessarily need. So you can, you, there's options there on page builders, especially the, the bigger, more popular ones like Elementor now. That you can, you can lock things down much more now than you used to when I was just when I was just using ACF. So there's definitely options there, and I, I think the. I, I think page builders are great because yeah, it does save you so much time, and uh, I think they're easier for for clients to grab a hold of because you know people are visual thinkers. I, don't want I didn't have a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wanted to comment on that too. Uh, I absolutely have zero experience with any sort of page builder whatsoever. I kind of entered as a developer and used ACF from the start. I absolutely love, I mean, the repeater, the repeater field and the flexible content field that, like, put it on the map. Most of the sites that I build these days use the flexible content field to almost be a very restricted page builder. You can add, a, you know, a content block. You can add two, uh, two, you know, columns side by side as long as, you know, the whoever built the theme has laid those out for you and they're, you know, it's already built out in the design. What I see in Gutenberg is truly exactly that, but you're editing it, you know, in line. When you're adding a full CTA with a background image, 
you can you know uh, choose the you know the individual color in the background. And there's definitely, definitely, definitely a learning curve to it. But um, I mean, especially if you're going to start building them, uh, I have zero React experience, and um, I mean mostly jQuery experience as a developer, not even a ton of vanilla JavaScript, but. As soon as I got into it and, and really actually spent the time as a developer trying to build out a, a new uh, a new Gutenberg block, it was honestly a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Setting up the individual items that you're seeing are like they're different module or uh, sorry uh, yeah uh, React oh components you know set up to do all of that. I really think that it's going to kind of be the the bridging gap between the flexibility and ease of theme development with ACF with, you know, the visual component of, you know, a standard page builder. But I was gonna, I was gonna ask, is it like, is it like you're creating your own page builder, basically? You get to create the blocks yourself, and right? My I speculation. I ask questions too, right? <laughs> <laughs> My speculation is that. Um, it's not really like uh, you, you can see the whole page out in front of you. It's supposed to be when set up, you know, when built correctly and built, you know, when your, when your theme is built on top of Gutenberg, your back end looks like your front end. When you want to change, you know, say, uh, you know, where a, a link goes, you go right into it, you click on that button that you just saw on the front end, you say, this needs to go somewhere else. <coughs> And you point it somewhere else. Whereas, I mean, again, I can't speak to you know Elementor or Beaver Builder or whatever the you know any of the um, the page builders are. But um, and I did like ACF for this, but it did mean going through and you know finding that individual block. And it's not you know you can't look for it in the same way that you would look at on the front end. Kind of have to know what you were looking for when. Your theme is built on top of Gutenberg, and time has been spent to create these individual blocks specifically, you know, for this theme, for this custom design. Um, you know, you're looking at the individual button that you just saw on the front end. I think that I think that it's going to mean. I don't think it's going to speed up theme development necessarily. From like you know, in comparison to ACF, or definitely not these page builders, but really kind of creating what you want your theme to look like, and you know, the changes between mobile and desktop, and really kind of allow you to do a lot of different things, um, and and build it exactly the way that you want it to look and feel and operate. So. You should have submitted a talk on the Yeah, next time. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I totally, I totally agree with you on that. I'm gonna say one thing, and right. but um, I totally agree with you on that. And I don't know if you noticed this, but ACF has a Gutenberg block, but they have, yeah, they haven't. It's in beta, but um, you can still install it. Yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, for that, it's I, I, I've done it and played with it. And for me, it was just a little clunky. I think I got it to work, but. You still, the part that you miss out on with that is the, the making your theme look the same on the back end as on the front end. So yeah, you can go through and you can put your block in line with all of the other blocks, your paragraphs and your heading blocks, but you're still selecting from a drop down the background color and it's not changing it in the back, you know, in the, the item's background. You're still, I mean, it's, it's, it's the flexible content field at the end of the day, you know, my opinion. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to say the same thing he said, just in different words. I'm just going to throw it out there. Like, I, I was a big ACF person too. I mean, still am. And uh, you know, so I would define like a bunch of custom fields for somebody's website. Like, hey, this is like a row, and the row has a heading and a call to action button and a photo, and you know, the client would fill that out. And then inevitably, midway through the project, they would want to, you know, add a new type of, you know, content-looking block thing or whatever. So I'd have to go in and rejig all of the custom fields and all that. And then eventually, that happened so many times that I realized, wait a minute, why am I using the repeater field 
so much. I should be building everything as a flexible content field and then that's what Peter builds into that. So I'd eventually start building everything with you know, flexible, flexible content or Peter fields. Then I started doing that so much that it's like, man, I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I need to come up with my own naming convention so that I can reuse this, these ACF flexible content fields as something that I can reuse on every project. And then I've got my own naming convention for flexible content fields and it's like, okay, what if I want to bring another developer onto the project? Now I have to educate them on how my flexible content template system works. And it's like, when you start to look at this, I've kind of built something that's starting to look a lot like a Gutenberg block. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying I'm like a, a you know a Gutenberg developer. No, I'm just saying the like the flexible content templating system I built starts to look a lot like a Gutenberg block. And so it's like, at that point, why don't we all just kind of have the same type of custom block system? Why should I have to rebuild a flexible content field to add a paragraph and a heading and a subheading? for every single site I build, yep. and everybody else has their own templating system, why can't we all just share the block system? Yeah. Case. I think it would be foolish for us to count Gutenberg out. I mean, it is, it, it's, it's here to stay, and I think you, you just gotta watch it, and WordPress is done for putting something out there, and letting it boil, and then slowly build on it. We've all seen that over the versions and versions and versions of everything else they've done. So it is going to get there, and, and yes, it might be slow right now, but I think it's going to gain yeah. steam over time. And if I wasn't in clear, that was pro block editor. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm trying to say, like, I feel like I'm reinventing the wheel every time. So. We, we all could be sitting here a year or two years from now and all saying, you know, everything's all moving towards the universe. And so I think it's, we have to make sure that it's, I mean, it, it's, it's going to stay around. Right? Uh, we've got, what time is it right now? I think it's right at 5 o'clock. So I think we're just about done unless there's any. Thank you. Listen.